that really is one of the, the ways we can begin to grasp these ideas, isn't it? By using scale, scaling up and scaling down, because otherwise we are we are all adrift. Yeah, I mean that that's that's what we do. And uh, in one of my books, I was trying to get my head round the emptiness of atoms, uh, and I do mention it in in the current book as well. We all have this picture in our mind of uh, an atom, pretty much like uh, a solar system, you know, with a little tight nucleus at the centre of an atom, a bit of knot of mass, pretty much like the sun, with uh, electrons flying around, flitting around, pretty much like planets around the sun. But what we don't realise is, in fact, the, the atom is incredibly empty. I mean, Tom Stoppard had this great image where he said that if the nucleus at the centre of the atom were like the uh, altar at the centre of the dome of St Paul's Cathedral, then the electrons were like kind of moths just fluttering around by the dome. So there's an incredible amount of empty space. How do you get your head around that? And really the metaphor I came up with is, is that if you squeezed all the empty space out of atoms, if you squeezed all the empty space out of the atoms of, of the whole human race, you could fit the entire human race in the volume of sugar cube. And that really just shows you how amazingly empty empty spaces. I mean, we are ghosts. Then, of course, the question is, why is matter, which seems so solid, so empty? And the answer to that is quantum theory, because it turns out that the building blocks of matter have this strange kind of dual quality. They simultaneously can behave as kind of localised little particles and spread out waves. And a, a, a wave is something that does take up, it, it takes up a lot of room. It needs a lot of elbow room. And the electrons in the atom need a lot of elbow room because they they are fundamentally waves, and that's why they need this vast amount of, of of space and why atoms are so empty. So what you do in this book, Marcus, is you take everyday familiar phenomena, things we're all familiar with, we may not even think about, you know, seeing your own reflection in a pane of glass, and you show how these everyday phenomena relate to some of the really big, interesting, tough questions of science. Yeah, absolutely. The idea from this book came from publicising my last book, when I suddenly thought, when I go on radio programmes, or uh, I'm constantly you know, grasping for this everyday thing, which I can relate the cosmic thing I'm talking about to. And then it suddenly occurred to me, well, why don't I write a book where I just do that? And it, it was a thread on which I could hang all these, all, these, uh, all these stories. It's subtitled, What Everyday Things Tell Us About the Universe. But, of course, it's what every day things tell us about the universe, knowing what we know today. I mean, you know, we, we do, you do need a little bit of background, and a caveman would not have come to the same conclusion, you know. But, but one of the things that's striking is your reflection in a window. Pack. If, you, if you look through a window, you can see the scene outside, maybe you can see the traffic outside, but you can also see a faint reflection of your face. And that's because glass is not completely you know it doesn't transmit 100% of light maybe it transmits 95% of light and maybe 5% gets reflected back from the surface so you see a reflection of your face how do you how do you understand that because it turns out we discovered in the uh, 20th century that light was a stream of bullet like particles machine gun bullets called photons all identical well how can you explain 95% being being transmitted and 5% being reflected if they're all identical I mean, they must all surely be affected identically by the glass. They must all go through and must all come back. And the person who, who really came up with the idea of the photon, who invented the photon, was Albert Einstein. And he was the person who realised that this observation, that you could actually see your face and you could also see outside of, uh, you know, of a window, was an earth-shattering observation. And it was, a, it was a bombshell in physics. No one else really saw it for a long time. Because what it means is that you have, you have to actually assume that each of the photons has a 95% chance of going through the, the window and a 5% chance of being reflected. So you have to allow randomness, unpredictability, into the heart of physics. And remember that physics was, was until, until that time, was a recipe for predicting the future. That's what physics is. So we know where the moon is today, we can predict where it is tomorrow. We just use, use the laws of physics to do that. But what Einstein realised is that the concept of the photon brings right into the heart of the phys physics the idea of randomness. If we were to follow an individual photon, a single photon, as it, as it headed towards a window pane, we would not be able to tell ahead of time whether that would be transmitted or reflected. 
we would only know that if we if we shot 100, 95 would go through and 105 would come back. So it's fundamentally unpredictable. And as Einstein famously said, God does not play dice with the universe. Uh, unfortunately, he turned out to be wrong because God does play dice with, with the universe. And it's not simply photons, it's every single denizen of the uh, microscopic world, the atoms that you're made of, the particles they're made of, they all behave in this random fashion. This is probably the most shocking discovery in the history of science that actually you can see just by looking at your face in a window pane.